So over the past few weeks, we've been in a series called Courageous Faith. And sometimes when you hear that courageous faith, you might be thinking to yourself, that's not me. Because courageous faith sounds like, you know, missionaries in Africa, right? Or or somebody that uh, perhaps where they worship Jesus, it's outlawed, and they might be martyred for their faith. And so when you hear courageous faith, you you think that. And, And of course, that requires courage. But the reality is, it requires courage to follow Jesus for all of us in the stuff of our everyday life. Here at Sun Valley, we help people meet, know, and following Jesus. We help people meet, know, and and follow Jesus. Following Jesus requires courage. And anytime he nudges you, anytime he prompts you to do something, you're going to feel some some fear. This is our verse for the series, 2 Timothy 1.7. Here's what the Bible says. For God has not given us a spirit of fear. So if you feel that fear, that's coming from somewhere else. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Following Jesus is as simple as your next step of obedience. But doing what Jesus says requires some courage. To stop doing some things that Jesus wants us to stop doing might require some some courage. But if we will lean into the power of the presence of God in our lives, he's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, and we can can trust him. Uh, Today, a good friend of mine is joining us. He and his wife, Tina, are uh, family members of Sun Valley, kind of part of our extended family. And I want to ask all of you, if you would, to give a very big Sun Valley welcome to my friend Ted Barrett. Would you do that? Hey, Thanks, Ted. Thanks for being with us today, Ted. Yeah, glad to be here. Everybody just realized how short I actually am. <laughs> As you came out, I had the fear of looking like a five-year-old, so we decided to, five-year-old the whole time if he and I stood next to each other, so I decided that we needed to sit down for this, uh, <laughs> for this conversation. So, Ted, you recently retired. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a pretty good job. I traveled a lot, and um, I had the best seat in the house, but I had to stand, as they say. So I was a major league umpire for uh, 28 years. I was 34 years altogether, if you include the minor leagues, so... Yeah, and now I'm retired. Yeah, 2022 was my last season, so this is the, my second season off the field. Yeah, good, good for you. I have some pictures here of uh, Ted. We just got this off the internet, all right, these pictures. So these are unauthorized pictures of Ted Barrett, but I wanted to show you him in action. And one of the things we've said in this series is the church is not a building that you come and sit in. It's a movement that you choose to be part of to help people meet, know, and follow Jesus. You can't come to church. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are the church. And so these pictures are actually Ted being the church. (laughs) That was good timing for that picture. (laughs) Being the church in Major League Baseball. And so you said you did that for a number of years. I'm going to take us backwards here for a little bit. You and I were, were talking in a different conversation a while ago mm-hmm. in something we were recording, and you used to box. Yeah, I did some boxing. Yeah, I was a uh, pretty good amateur, not so good as a professional, but uh, yeah, 1976, I saw the Rocky movie, and uh, like everybody else, a lot of other people, I said, I want to do that for a living. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I did. I, I, I fought amateur and um, even tried to turn pro. I moved to Las Vegas, got to spar with some champions there, and... Um, I figured that probably umpiring, even though I might get verbally abused, it'll be easier than getting uh, physically abused. So. Okay, so, okay, wait a second, because yeah. you, just, you just glossed over it. Yeah. I got to spar with some champions yeah. when I was in Vegas. Who did you spar with? Yeah, I got, you know, some of the big ones, you know, Evander Holyfield, and, and uh, I got to work with Mike Tyson for a couple of days. Um, George Foreman, who I say he hit me so hard that my oldest son was born two years later with a headache. So <laughs> he... He was a very hard puncher. Yeah. So I was about to ask you, how did that go? But you went into yeah. baseball, so that kind of tells yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Really, and I went to umpire school. It was uh, my dad really 
he was a great supporter of mine, still is, didn't like me boxing. So he kind of, uh, he said, hey, I'll pay for you to go to umpire school. And I thought, wow, five weeks in Florida, getting beat up in the ring, I'll take the five weeks in Florida. And uh, I thought it worked out pretty well. Yeah. What is your, we'll do a couple of sports questions here. Yeah. So what, what is your best memory in baseball? Do you have a highlight? Uh, I've got a few. Um, my first game, 1994, in Texas at the Rangers, Red Sox Rangers. Um, and then um, I, I, behind the plate for two perfect games. I was actually on the field for three, but... So in 1999, I was behind the plate for David Cohn's perfect game. Nice. And that was a pretty special uh, memory for me. And then 2012, Matt Cain threw a perfect game in San Francisco, and that was a special memory. And then um, being the crew chief for the 2018 All-Star Game in Washington, D.C., and then being the crew chief for the 2018 World Series between the Red Sox and Dodgers. So you asked me for one. I guess they're like kids. I can't just pick one, right? Yeah. I have a bunch of them. So 2018 was a big year. It was a big year, yeah. Crew chief for the series, crew chief for the All-Star game. Yeah, 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 that was a lot of fun. We call that getting the sweep and umpiring. So. Yeah. How many uh, World Series have you, have you been in as an umpire? So I umpired five World Series. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then we're talking backstage in two All-Star games. Two All-Star games, yeah. 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 That is really, really cool. Yeah, it was, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. It's intense. Um, it's stressful. Uh, but, yeah. Looking back on it, it was a wonderful time. So do you get a ring or anything for doing I do World get Series a, games? I do get a ring, and I wore this one today. Is there a reason I'm not wearing it? Oh, here. <laughs> yeah, so we, we, we obviously teased about this. So if you were here a couple of weeks ago, uh, uh, my friend Ben comes to Sun Valley. He was with the Seahawks for a number of years, and I was wearing his Super Bowl ring. Did any of you guys remember that? Okay, the reason I'm not wearing Ted's ring is because it falls off when my hand, <laughs> my hand turns, ben, Ben's ring fit. So all the umpires get a ring. Yes, yeah, we all get a ring, and um, then we, we can also get one for our, for our spouses. And uh, yeah, it's a wonderful token for us, for the World Series and the All-Star Game. So I've got seven rings, and um, we, we also pay tax on them, too. So we'll, we'll... <laughs> It's a sore subject with umpires, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, and I, I was talking with your wife, Tina, backstage. She has one as yeah. well. And, it, and it, instead of having a team name on it, because you can't do that. Right, no, well, that wouldn't be good. That so. would not be good yeah. if you had a favorite team. Yeah, no. Uh, it has your name on it. Yes, yeah. So it's, yeah. yeah, they go in a case usually, but I wear them on special occasions, and, you know, hanging out with you is a special occasion. So. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was so nice. <laughs> when, uh, when did you give your life to Jesus? Man, I was eight years old, and I went to, it was actually the first time I went to church uh, with my family. We all went on Easter Sunday, just like a lot of families do, and um, my uncle was, uh, he was the assistant pastor, worship pastor, bus driver, a small church. He wore a lot of hats uh, back in North Tonawanda, New York, which is a suburb of Buffalo, and he was the one, Sunday school, he laid out the gospel to the kids, and I was like, yeah, I, I need that, right? I, I knew that uh, my sin had separated me from God and, and Jesus' death and sacrifice is what puts me back in communion with him. And it's funny because at eight years old, I got it. It was so simple. And then as I get older, you know, I kind of <laughs> complicated it a little bit, but uh, it, it's so beautiful and it's so simple that that's, that's what it takes. And um, I gave my life to Christ at eight. And then uh, as time went on, um, you know, going to, going to church, Sunday school, and I actually felt called to ministry and had some people tell me, you know, I think encouraged me to go into ministry. And so um, as I got older and I went to college and, you know, but I was also, I was, I was afraid to live out my faith. I was playing football in college. Um, I didn't know what the guys would think about me, right? And so I was kind of an undercover Christian. One of the worst things anybody ever said to me was at one point I was going to chapel before a game and they said, I didn't know you were a Christian. I'm like, man, that hurts when someone says that, right? It's something you don't want to hear. Um, but then as I got into umpiring, uh, it was the same thing. I didn't feel like uh, I could, I didn't want to be uh, perceived as soft because as umpires, right, we got to stand up for ourselves. We can't get run over. We have to be decisive. And I thought like being a Christian, you would be perceived as soft. And I just had a warped view of who Jesus is, really, um, and so it wasn't until I realized and started studying the Gospels, man, Jesus, Jesus was a stud. He'd have been a great umpire. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I started to get excited about that. And so um, 
And, and then I decided to become more bold with my faith from there. Yeah, so, so you felt called to ministry. Mm -hmm. in, in your mind, did that mean you were like wrestling with being a pastor? Or yeah. what, what did that mean for you? Did, did you come to a crossroads with that? Yes, I did. You know, coming through the minor leagues, it's very difficult to get to the big leagues as, as an umpire because when I went to school, there were 64 major league umpires. Now there's 76. There's been expansion and replay. Uh, and about 200 minor league guys. So there's really, it's, the odds are very, very long of making it to the big leagues. So my plan was, I told God, you know, if I get to the big leagues, great. If I don't, then I'll go into full-time ministry. Uh, right? We make these deals with God, and he kind of snickers. Um, and then I made it to the big leagues. So I was like, okay, good. This is what you wanted for me. I'm a big league umpire. But he's kept that call on my life. And he's like, no, I want you in ministry. So there was a moment of surrender where I, I said, all right, God, I surrender. Uh, I want what you want. I know I won't be happy and fulfilled until I do. But I'm doing this under protest because I thought it was a, it's a dirty trick that you're, you got me to the big leagues and now you're pulling me out. Uh, and he's like, no, uh, my sweet idiot child. Uh, <laughs> I put you in the big leagues for a reason. And, and you are in full-time ministry. Yeah. You just got to do it there. Which was, you know, it, it was a turning point in my life when I came to realize that. But then it was like, oh, how? <laughs> yeah. How? You know, and so um, that was the challenge from there. But the reality is, you know, and I just want to encourage all of you, whatever, whatever job you have, whatever vocation you're in, you're in full-time ministry if you're a follower of Jesus. And he's calling you to that. And you might be saying, I can't do that, right? But you read all through the Bible, you know, God's calling Moses. He's calling uh, so many different people. And, and they're like, oh, not me. And he's like, yes, you. And he says, I will be with you. And um, so that's what he told me. He's like, yeah, you're going to do this. And I'm going to be with you. Yeah. So what can we be afraid of? You know, yeah. looking back on it, I feel embarrassed and foolish that I was afraid. Uh, but the reality is uh, we don't have to be. Yeah. I, I want to just, let's just have a, let me just be the pastor here for a second. Uh, and I, I'm 100% Ted in agreement with you. It's exactly what the Bible teaches. So Ted's talking about, he did call me to ministry, but he called me to ministry in Major League Baseball as an umpire. Okay. So let me just be really blunt. Um, the pastors here at Sun Valley, people on our staff, we're not the only ones called to ministry around here. If you're a follower of Jesus, that's the calling on your life. When I was a kid, because uh, I felt like I was supposed to be a preacher and I was you know, nervous about that. Uh, the first time I preached, I threw up in the back before I walked out on <laughs> stage. It was one of those kinds of things. And sometimes I still feel feel nauseous. But they would say things like, you know, son, because I'm from the South, are you called to the ministry? Mm. Right. And then I had to prove that I was. But then I started reading the Bible and come to find out uh, we're all called to ministry. Because to follow Jesus is to give and, and serve. And so one of the things we've been talking about in the series, and, and if I can just get in your grill here a little bit, just look you in the eye <laughs> the best I can. What's God asking of you? What does it mean for you to give and serve and to follow Jesus in every area of your life? Uh, I think sometimes what, what we do is, um, especially as men, you know, God bless my family, bless my marriage, you know, bless these different parts of our lives, but we kind of compartmentalize it. Yeah. Did you ever do that in your journey? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it was... Um, at home, uh, you know, I would act, uh, I'd be a Jesus follower, trying to raise, be a godly husband, uh, raise my children that way. Certainly at church, uh, certainly around the pastors um, and other <laughs> church people, I'm like, you know, this. But then I would go off to the season and, um, you know, there's, there's certain things on a baseball field, the way things are run. And, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of cuss words. You guys can see that now as we have high def TV and lip readers, and, and it's kind of like the military, you know, where the, the cuss words are nouns, adjectives, pronouns, and I fell right into that, and uh, I was doing a game, it was the Chicago White Sox, I can't remember exactly when, what year, but early 2000s, and there was a third base coach, and um, long story short, he made me mad, I let him know he made me mad, and I let him have it with every cuss word I had in my arsenal. I was feeling pretty good about myself. I was like, man, I really told him. I showed him, put him in his place. 
there's a player, uh, Chris Singleton. He um, played with a lot of big league teams. He was an outfielder, a uh, great man of God. And he just came by and very nicely, very gently said, hey, man, uh, I know you're a Jesus follower. I just want to remind you who you represent. And I said, uh, hey, you know what, man? You know what you need, you need to do? Take your glove and go out and play center field. Don't worry about me. All right, just worry about yourself. All right. And then I lay in bed that night and I was like, how dare he? Who does he think he is? How dare he call me on the carpet like that? And the Holy Spirit came on and said, I sent him. I sent him. Yeah. I'm not used to being clapped for. That's pretty cool. I used to be getting booed. But, but he was right. And he did it, he did it out of love. He did it in, in, a, in a very loving way. And um, I went to him the next day and I said, hey, man, can I talk to you? And he's like, I don't think I want to talk to you. And I was like, no, no, I want to apologize. I said, thank you for saying that. And, he, and I said, I'm sorry I was mad at the time. He said, no, no, I get it. Nobody likes to be uh, told they do something wrong. And, but what God was saying is, if you want to follow me, you've got to do it on the field, off the field, wherever you are, when the cameras are on, when they aren't on. And uh, so I was like, okay, God, I get that, but I need help. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to help you. Yeah, we all do. Yeah, and I prayed, and um, I can say this with all humility, that um, I didn't swear on a baseball field again. I've sworn off the field, I'm ashamed to say, but... <laughs> but it, so if, there, if there's behaviors that you need to change as you represent Jesus... Man, he's going to do it for you. He will do it with you. He's there. And as he points those out. And so as time went on, as I got to be older, gray-haired veteran guy, I would approach players. You know, you'd see a, I'd see a guy doing an interview where he was claiming that he was a Jesus follower, which is wonderful. But then he was acting another way on the field. And I would go over to him and I'd say, hey, I want to tell you something that someone told me once. And, you know, I'd tell him, hey, remember, kids are watching. People are watching. Remember who we represent. And sometimes I'd get the same reaction I gave them, and sometimes they'd say thank you and, and, and be, be gracious about it. But I was also able to always do it out of love because we can get self-righteous and high and mighty, right? Because I would be like, look at that guy. I saw him on the 700 Club last night. Now he's yelling and screaming and swearing at my partner. And then uh, the Holy Spirit would say, yeah, I used to know a guy like that too. <laughs> so, well, yeah. Maybe I shouldn't be so high and mighty, yeah. right? So. Yeah. I, uh... Yeah, I always have to be reminded. The Bible is supposed to be a mirror first. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a pair of binoculars that we look at everybody else first. It's a mirror. Yes. Uh, and then out of humility, if we can help somebody else, if it would be in the realm of loving them well, then that's, then that's what we do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the Bible's not a weapon to wield. No. Uh, it's a mirror to examine our own lives so that we might, so that we might love well. You, you said this um, a moment ago that you thought... You know, you couldn't take Jesus into baseball because yeah. that's soft, right? And, and you had to go out there and be in charge. Um, in my experience, and I, and I know a lot of men that think that, uh, I got to be soft if I'm going to be a follower of Jesus. Um, I don't think anybody who knows you would think that you're soft <laughs> in, a, in a, you know, weak way. Um, in my experience, it requires a ton of courage yeah. um, and strength that I don't even have to follow Jesus. Has that been your experience? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and again, Jesus says, I'm with you, right? The end of uh, Matthew, what does he say before he ascends? I will be with you. Uh, so that should give us the courage, but I, I didn't always have that. And so as I felt God calling me into ministry in my job, uh, I was like, okay, there's got to be kind of a, a coming out point where I declare this. So uh, I had uh, a, a testimony card I saw one of the players had done where it's a picture of him and then on the back. It's like a regular trading card. He gives, he gives a brief, shares about his faith. And so I had a card made. It was a picture of me umpiring on the cover and then on the back uh, just laid out a little gospel and put it in perspective of umpiring. And I handed it out at the union meeting. Um, I gave everybody a card, and I went home and I told my wife, Tina, I said, I just committed career suicide because I don't think anybody wants to work with the Jesus guy, right? Uh, and so the way it works in Major League Baseball is the crew chief, he writes down uh, five or six guys that he would prefer to work with, and then they, he gets three other guys, and they stay together the whole year. So he gets some input. 
So I was on a crew that year. A couple of months later, a supervisor came in the room and he said, he goes, hey, I just want you to know uh, you were the most requested guy uh, this year. And so I don't know what you did, but that was confirmation to me that, you know, just be obedient and take that step. And then, uh, you know, we started praying in the locker room before the game. Um, and then after the game, we'd give thanks. My first World Series was 2007. Ed Montague was the crew chief and working with another brother, Chuck Merriweather, who's since gone to heaven. But he said, hey, will you guys pray in the locker room before we go out? And then uh, a few years later, God's saying, I want you to take that public a little bit more. Um, I want you to pray at home plate. And I was like, I don't know about that one. <laughs> I mean, this is Major League Baseball, right? So I had a, a crew of guys, and, and, you know, they were all believers. And I said, hey, I want to try this. And they said, all right, I'm in. <clears throat> and I was nervous. We were bold. We did it. And it wasn't a big declaration. We didn't have the microphone on. We just gathered together at home plate. And we said a prayer, asking God to lead us through the game. And um, that became a tradition. I did that from that point on. And then being the crew chief in the 2018 All-Star Game, one of the, my favorite pictures is the six-man crew, because it's six men in playoffs in All-Star Game. We're gathered around home plate, arm in arm, and we're praying. And then later that year, we did it in the World Series as well. And so, and then I got a lot of comp, uh, comments from players saying, hey, that was really cool. Or, you know, fans, uh, they'd see me, and once in a while, someone would recognize me and say, hey, I like when you pray at home plate. That's really cool. Yeah. So, um, you know, so again, something that I was scared to do, and God was saying, just take that step and um, you know, using it for his glory. Yeah, I, th I think there's um, something really powerful in uh, humility. Uh, and, and just being real, being who you are, uh, non-judgmental, but, you, you know, uh, courageously strong, not, not in a, you know, I'm here to tell you how to do it, right. but, but just calm, be who you are, be obedient, mm. and the Holy, Spirit, the Holy Spirit works in that. Yeah, and, you know, God's uniquely gifted us all in different ways, and, you know, I think he just wants us to take all the gifts that he's given us, and just go out and share them with the world yeah. and for his glory. And it might be one thing for me, it might be another thing for you and for someone else, but he's definitely given you something that he wants you to take out into the world and share and glorify him. Yeah. Well, Ted and I were talking this week, and I said, all right, man, uh, is there a verse of scripture that you want to share? And, uh, and he said this one, Colossians 3.15, as it comes here on the screen, so I'm going to read it, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. This is Colossians 3.15. Here's what it says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So we're talking about Christ ruling here. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. And you shared that verse of scripture with me. We talked about it a little bit, but what stands out to you there? Yeah, that's my life verse. Uh, for those of you who speak Greek, which I don't, um, <laughs> you know the word rule there is actually the word for umpire. So let the peace of Christ be the umpire in your heart. And uh, what that means is when you have a decision to make, uh, when you're going through something in your life, um, you ask Jesus for it, and then that decision that you make, you have peace in it. And when you have peace, that's the umpire uh, calling, hey, that's the right thing to do. And if you... Make a decision whether you don't have peace in it, it's probably the wrong decision. Yeah. Because the Holy Spirit is going to give you peace when you make the right decision. And not only that, though, the peace of the unity of the body. Um, we talked about this a little bit. And, and there's, in the church, there can be separation. There can be conflict. When there's peace, that means you're doing the right thing. Um, and, and peace is not the, abs uh, the absence of conflict. It's the resolution of it. So, and one thing, uh, I, wasn't, I wasn't a great umpire. Um, I was a good umpire. There's great umpires. I was a good one. But one thing that I, that I did really well, which I have to give credit to Jesus, not to me, when there was a situation on the field, whether it be a throwing incident, a fight, a brawl, I felt like I could walk into a situation and bring calm. And that's the Holy Spirit. That's what he does. When you guys walk and you walk into your job, you walk into your vocation, when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you actually are taking steps with the Spirit of God in you. And when you walk into a situation, the situation changes when Jesus shows up. 
And he takes chaos and he turns it to order. So I got comments like, man, when you show up, everything calms down. I'm like, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> that's Jesus showing up in the chaos and bringing order. So, and I just want to encourage all of you that whatever situation you walk into, man, it's Jesus bringing peace. And then we start taking steps into enemy territory, and we're taking it back for Jesus. And, and you can do that. You can do that through the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. Mm. Yeah. I've never met a blessed troublemaker. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. I, well, okay, I'll just be the pastor again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah come on. Uh, we're we're going to enter into a, a, seri- a, a, a season here uh, in the life of our nation where a lot of people are going to be arguing with each other. You guys know what I'm saying, right? It's already starting to happen. Uh, and it's going to in- increase between now and November. Mm. And so maybe this is a good opportunity. Uh, let's, let's vote our conscience. Let's, let's follow the spirit and, and the decisions that we make there. But as we talk to people, maybe let's be peacemakers. Because uh, I ain't never met a blessed troublemaker. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I, I would think there would be moments when that's got to be really difficult uh, in, in baseball. I mean, the, the, the highlight reels, if I go to YouTube, you know, somebody throwing somebody out of a game, all of that. Yeah. And there you are going, how can I, how can I make peace? Yeah. Because that's the goal, right? Is you want to, we want to, the ball, contrary to popular belief, all an umpire wants when he walks out there is a good, clean ball game. We like quick ball games. Good, a good, because we don't get paid by the hour. Uh, we don't care who wins. We want a good, clean game, well played, where we're not a part of the story that everything went smoothly, and we like order, and we like peace. And, uh, yeah, when we have that, that's a good day at work. Yeah. You said this earlier in the service because people clapped about something you said. You said, I'm not used to people clapping. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, an umpire never gets cheered for. Mm. You get booed. Yeah. What, what do you do with those kind of things? Well, you know, a lot of times people are booing when we make a call or make a decision, and I just say, forgive them, Lord. They know not what they're booing about. <laughs> <laughs> Because usually we're right, and they just don't, they don't get it yet, so they'll, yeah. they'll figure it out. Yeah. No. That was not a setup. I had no idea what he was going to say. <laughs> that's, that's pretty good. Um, so you talk about there was a season of your life. Let's circle back around here. Yeah. Uh, where you compartmentalized yeah. your faith. Yeah. Would, you, would, say, would you say that was a season in your life when Christ wasn't fully ruling in your heart? Yeah, I would say that. You know, I, I kind of, uh, I would kind of... I didn't understand God's word that well. And so, um, you know, I had what I had learned as a child. And then as I kind of got into college, I was in the Bay Area in the, in the early 80s. There was a whole lot of stuff going on. There's the, the Jesus Seminar. I remember these guys. And they, they're these super smart PhD guys who don't recognize Jesus' deity. So, in other words, they, didn't, they don't believe that Jesus was God. Uh, and so, but they were so smart, and I would read them. And I started thinking... Uh, man, maybe I'm off on this. Maybe what I learned as a kid isn't true. Maybe I, I went through some of that. Yeah. yeah. And then, but then circling back, it's like, okay, I'm going to dive into the scriptures, especially the gospels. I'm going to dive into the gospels. Is Jesus who he said he is? Because if he's not, then really we're kind of just spinning our wheels here. Sure. But if he is, and he died and resurrected, man, we, we've got to pay attention now to what he says. And what I came to was, yes, Jesus is who he said he is. This Bible, it, every word of it is true. All right, so now I've got to start living my life like that instead of, because I was living my life, uh, it was actually on the, on the outside looking in. It was a cool religion because I kind of did what I wanted. Yeah. And I followed Jesus, but. I, I got grace. It's yeah, all good. Yeah, and I don't have, you know, that part, we'll just cut that part of the Bible out where it says don't do that. Yeah. I will take the good stuff. I don't want the bad stuff. But then once I realized, like, no, this is all true, man, I got to follow it 100% completely. Then I'm like, okay, now I've got to go all in. And then it was, and I've got to do that on the baseball field too. Um, so that, instead of compartmentalizing, I was like, all right, I'm 100% all in in every area and every aspect of my life. And he can t- still continues to work on that with me. Yeah, one more question. So our, our series is called Courageous Faith. Yeah. When you decided to go all in, yeah. were you afraid? Yes. I was afraid. I was worried. <clears throat> I w- and I, God's still working on this with me, worried about what people would think about me. Now think about how odd that is. An umpire that stands in front of 50,000 people, millions of people watching on TV, and 
was calling Safer out and going with it, and yet I was still worried about what people think about me. And social media, man, don't, don't uh, like look me up and then see what they say because it's, it's all not true. <laughs> Forgive them. But yeah, just so you, I don't read comments on myself either. That's okay. always yeah. a bad idea. Like, yeah. And, and so, um, yeah, I was worried about what people were think, would think about me when really I should be worried about what Jesus thinks about me because at the, at the end of this, career, this ring, everything is going to burn up and none of that will mean anything. And then we'll stand before Jesus one day and, you know, hopefully, hopefully I hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. That's... that's uh, better reward than, than any World Series ring or anything else. But still, at that point, I was worried about how I'd be received. Uh, I'd be, I was worried about how I'd be um, looked at. But Jesus is like, man, I'm with you. I've given you a certain set of skills. <laughs> right? Like the, the guy that says... Uh, Taken. Yeah, it's a movie. Yeah. yeah. A certain but, set of skills. Yes. Um, but that's what Jesus said. We've been given a certain set of skills. I'm going to help you develop those, and you're going to go off, and you're going to serve me, and you have nothing to be afraid of. And I love it when, when I read through the Bible and an, and an angel shows up, it's always like, fear not, <laughs> don't be afraid, right? And I think when Jesus is saying, take that next step, step out in faith, and don't be afraid, fear yeah. not. And because he's given us, uh, you know, not a spirit of, of timidity and fear, he's like boldness and power. So if you were getting a phone call, and you looked at your phone, and the caller ID said, God. <laughs> How many of you would be like, letting that go to voicemail? Right. <laughs> <laughs> we have this idea that if we do what God says, he's going to mess up our life. So I'm going to do what I do. Man, everybody lean in. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Our problem is not that we don't love God enough. Our problem is we do not realize how much he loves us. Listen, going all in is for your good. He loves you. You can trust him. So let's practice courageous faith. Can we thank Ted for being with us today? I'm going to ask if you would to bow your head and close your eyes. Let's pray together. And if you would say right now, you just confess, I'm compartmentalizing my faith. And you'd be willing to admit that. I want to pray specifically for you. Ted's going to pray specifically for you. Right now, all locations, would you just lift your hand? Yeah, all over the room. All locations, the Lord sees you. Thank you. Ted, I'm going to ask you to pray for these who've lifted their hand and for all of us. Yes. Father God, you are a good, good Father, and you love us, and you've gifted us, and you've uniquely designed each and every one of us. Father, you've rescued us. We were dead in our sins, and you gave us life. And Jesus, we want to follow you, and we want to go all in. But we're scared, and we're nervous, and we're worried about what people think about us. So Jesus, help us not to be scared. And in your word, you say that you will never leave us, and you will never forsake us. And you say, go, and I will be with you always. And we thank you, Jesus, that you're never going to leave us, and that you're always with us. So make us bold not with a spirit of fear, but with a spirit of boldness. And with the power of the Holy Spirit, may we go forth and do what you've got for us. Help us to hear your voice, the voice of the Good Shepherd. Help us to block out the enemy's voice. Jesus, show us who we are. And Jesus, we thank you that you love us. We thank you, we thank you that you're never going to leave us. So we claim that promise. We ask these things. In the great and mighty name of Jesus, amen.